Good evening and welcome to Tracking the Tropics. This is your weekly in-depth look at the Atlantic hurricane season and how it affects you. Hurricane Delta is gone, but there is something else worth watching tonight in the Atlantic. And on the Pacific side, a completely different season over there. We will look into both of those in a minute. Glad you're here with us. I'm Wes Owenstein live in Raleigh, North Carolina. But first, Hurricane Delta. The storm made landfall last Friday. It was a category two when it hit Louisiana, and it's the second one to hit Louisiana in as many months. Four people lost their lives as the storm hit southwest Louisiana. More than 100,000 people across Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi lost power at some point. And still today, four days later, more than 30,000 are still in the dark. Crews have been working tirelessly to restore power and hopefully some normalcy to the residents who have just had a doozy of a storm system so far. So let's talk about what's going on out in the tropics right now. And pretty much every other week of this system, I would prepare for you a long list of things to talk about. But tonight we have just one and we won't say that too loudly in a, a, an, a, an abundance of caution, hopefully not to jinx ourselves. But outside the Caribbean, just to the east, is a disorganized area of clouds, showers, and thunderstorms, an elongated area of low pressure that the National Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on and over the next two to five days, give it a 20% chance of developing. Now some upper level winds, along with the fact that it could be headed over some islands, will most likely keep this from developing over the next couple of days. So while there is technically something out there, the likelihood of it being our next name storm system looks very, very low. However, since it is now technically a trackable system and invest, a lot of the computer models have started to grab hold of it, and we have some idea, if anything were to develop, where it would go. And again, the upper level winds and the fact that it will continue to drift off to the west over several islands will likely keep this from developing. But staying right along the Caribbean islands is where we expect that area of showers and thunderstorms to drift over the next couple of days. And just to bring you up to speed, so we just checked Delta off the list. If this next name system does get a name after becoming a tropical depression and possibly a tropical storm, it would be named Epsilon. Again, that is a long shot. That would be the 26th name storm in this record breaking season. Remember, we're chasing 2005. That's the year where we had 28 name storms after Hurricane Delta this year at 25 name storms ranks second all time in number of name storms for the Atlantic hurricane season. These records go all the way back to 1851. So we're talking about a lot of real estate here and we're talking about a place where we've only gone one other time. The fact that we are now in the Greek alphabet. So as we take a step back and look at a season that has still technically a month and a half left to go, starts June 1st, ends November 30th. We all remember it peaks the second week of September 7th. September 10th is the climatological peak of the hurricane season. So where are we on this graph that shows us tropical activity through the hurricane season? Well, we are on the downside. We are approaching the second full week of October. It's now October 13th. The activity that we're seeing this time of year in the middle of October is very similar to what we would see in the middle of August. And I know that sounds strange, but over the last 100 years, when you look at hurricane activity, the activity that we see on average right now in the middle of October is the same that we see in August. Had a great graphic pop up today on my Twitter feed that I want to share with you before we move on to our next subject. And that is from the, the great Dr. Phil Klausbach from Colorado State University. He went ahead and took the typical storm formation zones and narrowed it down to the next two weeks. So since 1966, up until last year, from the time period of October 14th tomorrow to October 27th, essentially the next two weeks, this is where all the storms have formed in that time frame. So everywhere you see a little dot is where a storm was born and then of course moved on to do something else. Green tropical storms, blue one or two category one or two hurricanes, red category three, four or five. And you can see, remember, the one I just showed you was just right about here outside the Caribbean. But most of the storms form out here in the open waters of the Atlantic. And from experience, you and I know that a lot of times that far out there, 
they curve to the north and don't really impact. But we also get several storms that form in the Caribbean. Look how many red dots there are in the Caribbean. So if we're going to get a bad storm in October, it's most likely going to start down here in the Caribbean. But we do see some storms form out here. They generally don't turn into anything nasty. Just an interesting little bit of climatology as we head into the middle of October. Now, when tropical systems approach southern Louisiana, often one of the first places to get hit is Grand Isle. Fortunately, the barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico was spared from much of Delta's destruction due to reconstruction of the area's burrito levee, as they call it. Have you ever heard of that before? Well, many residents are happy with the way it turned out. WGNO's Bill Wood has more. On Grand Isle, the word of the day is gratitude. A few streets flooded, but Hurricane Delta did not beat up the barrier island, usually the first Louisiana location to suffer from a storm. What kept most of the water out there in the Gulf was built right here along the beach. A seven mile long levee the Army Corps of Engineers made from supersized sandbags. Just look at it, and you can tell why the 1,500 folks who live here call it the burrito. Grand Isle dodged the bullet. Grand Isle's police chief is the guy everybody calls Scooter. We're thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my savior and he saved Grand Isle again. A couple of power lines were pulled down when 47 mile an hour wind gusts blew through, but electricity stayed on. Three red beans, four baby butter beans. At Grand Isle supermarket, they count their cans of beans and their blessings. Three black beans. I feel like we have a halo over us here in Gray now. On the Louisiana island where hurricanes historically hit first and worst, Hurricane Delta barely took a bite. Serious weather impacts like wind and devastating weather, we managed to miss all of that this season. We were very, very lucky and fortunate. Because of a burrito on the beach. Bill Wood, WGNO News. Hey, ironically enough, it's Taco Tuesday and Bill's talking about burritos. Some good news uh, for our friends in Grand Isle. You know, as we continue to live through this historic season, can you believe we have now had 10 landfalling named storms, tropical storms or hurricanes, in the continental United States this year? That is a record. We have never had more than 10, and that's what we're living through right now. The records go back to 1851. And as we kind of just go clockwise around the United States, from Hannah to Beta in Texas to Laura, Delta, Cristobal, and Marco in Louisiana. You know, Delta was the second hurricane to hit Louisiana this year. We mentioned that. But 2005, they had three. They had Cindy, they had Rita, and they had Katrina. So Louisiana is used to getting hit a lot, but not often do they have multiple hurricane hits. We come over to Sally, which made it in along the uh, Gulf Coast around the Florida Panhandle. The East Coast has been kind of bored this year. No complaints there. Bertha, Isaias, and Faye. So 10 named landstalling forms. Most of them, again, have been in the Gulf of Mexico. These are the seven named storms that we have tracked throughout the year in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, Laura and Delta, the two really bad storms, were within just a few miles of each other, about six weeks apart of making landfall. So some horrible news and some bad luck for southwest Louisiana. But the busy season continues. So Delta, the 25th named storm. This week is also an important week in the history of hurricanes because two days ago is the anniversary of Hurricane Michael hitting Florida back in 2018. Two days from now is the anniversary of Hurricane Hazel coming to the United States back in 1954. There's Hazel, came up through the Carolinas. There's Michael, one of the few Category 5 storms to ever hit the United States. There's only been four. Michael and Hazel, the 8th and 13th named storms, hit around this time years ago. 8 and 13 versus where we are this year on 25. History. We're all living through. All right, if you take a minute and search YouTube and type in Pawpaw Sammy and Alley Bug, you'll run across videos of a man named Sammy Woods and his granddaughter who love gardening and landscaping. You can't make this stuff up. Now, unfortunately, for the 
eight-year-old Woods. He was trapped under a tree for hours when Hurricane Delta came through the small town of Watson, which is just outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Check out the story of how Woods' life was saved, and through it all, he's in high spirits, ready to get back to what he does best. Just a quick search on YouTube, and you'll find Sammy Woods' latest passion. Whoa, I'm losing him. <laughs> At 78 years old, he's more savvy on the internet than most people his age. He has his granddaughters to thank for that. Pawpaw Sammy and Alley Bug. That's our YouTube channel, and we give tutorials on how to make garden beds. Today's video is about companion plants. It's sciencey uh, and quirky, and just like Woods, but more importantly, his garden channel blossomed a bond between him and his family, one that he was trying to save when Delta hit. He was moving his plants out of the shed when the unthinkable happened. An oak tree the size of a bus fell through the shed with him and wife Barbara inside. The oak tree itself hit my grandfather in the head. Uh, he was knocked unconscious and then he was pinned under the oak tree. An hour and 15 minutes passed while Woods was under this tree with a bleeding cut on the back of his head. I didn't want to cry about it. I just wanted to stay positive and you know, I know he would want us to just to not worry about him and to keep going, but it's definitely tough. <laughs> While he recovers, some people that know him and some people that don't wanted to help. They cut down most of the tree and pulled the branches out of the yard. His shed and the plants it housed, those are next up to fix. He's still being held in the trauma ICU. As for Woods, he's got 27 stitches in his head, a cracked chest, and a fractured toe but his granddaughters say he's a fighter. When we go through anything hard in life, you can just hear his voice in the back of your mind telling you, you know, that's life, life's hard, but you have to, you know, keep pushing. And in time, when his shed is finally fixed, he'll go back to posting. And being that internet savvy grandfather, his family remembers. Tara St. Cyr, Fox 44 News. Two really good stories coming out of Louisiana after Hurricane Delta. Next up on Tracking the Tropics, the naming and the history of naming and retiring tropical systems. While we've made it all the way through the Greek alphabet this year, there's a lot that goes into coming up with and retiring named tropical systems. Recently, our Brian Hutton Jr. talked with meteorologist Amanda Holly about what's involved in that. They discussed what's going to happen with the name Delta after the hurricane made landfall last week. But we start with what happens with a storm before it gets a name. What is an invest? It all begins with what is an invest, right? Why would we name a tropical wave? Well, an invest is literally just what it sounds. It's an area of investigation. It's usually some showers and thunderstorms out there in the Atlantic or the Pacific that the National Hurricane Center, well, they want some more information about. So as soon as they designate it an invest, we usually get those famous spaghetti models. And that's what we typically see um, if a storm has the chance to, or some showers and thunderstorms has a chance to develop into something tropical. Now, the INVEST, they actually have a naming convention. An INVEST begins with a number and then a letter. Usually you'll, you'll hear us say INVEST 91L, right? Well, the number itself runs from 90 to 99. And then once we hit 99, it, it jumps back down to 90. The letter is the designation of where that INVEST is at. So the letter L means that that INVEST, that tropical wave, is in the Atlantic. And E means it's in the Pacific, the, the East Pacific there. So INVEST 90. L, that would mean we're tracking a tropical wave, some areas of showers and thunderstorms that have a potential chance of developing in the Atlantic Basin. So that's it's kind of where uh, the invests come from. A lot of people wonder why would we even name an invest or a tropical wave, some showers and thunderstorms. But it's actually very helpful for us to get those spaghetti models, and that's kind of the first place it starts. Yeah, very important for the all important spaghetti models, right? What everybody looks forward to and find your favorite one, even though it's not how they work. That's a discussion, though, for another day. Uh, and you, I see you're kind of uh, leading me here, even the graphic behind you. You know, the naming system is something that, you know, it gets a lot of talk, especially anytime there's a major storm that, that impacts any area that's inhabited. Uh, so how does that naming system work by the World Meteorological Organization? And how do they decide then to retire names of importance? Yeah, 
Yeah, so you know, before we started our list of names that everyone knows so well now, in the early 1900s, the storms, they were basically just named arbitrarily, whether it's a date or a sailboat that they knocked over or an area uh, along the coastline that they came into. But since 1953, we started using those short names because, well, it's a lot easier to identify, especially if we have multiple storms going on at once. It's a lot easier to remember long term as well. But especially when we have both of those, if we have two or even more storms, which we know very well here in the 2020 season, it's a lot easier to track these storms if they have short, easily identifiable names. Now, in 1979, the World Meteorological Organization took over the naming process, and now we use the standard alphabet, of course, that everybody knows, ABC, uh, and they add, actually added in male names, because when we first started naming storms, we only used female names. But in 1979 there, they added in male names, and now they, they actually wrote now, I, I don't particularly like, like, particularly like to call a, a storm he or she, but they are actually um, every other. So if we start with a male name, it will then go to a female name for the B name, and then the C name will be back to a male name. Now, in the Atlantic, we have six lists of 21 names. They're in alphabetical order. However, Q, U, X, Y, and Z are skipped in the Atlantic. In the Pacific, it works a little bit pretty, pretty similar here. Six lists of 24 names, though, where only Q and U are skipped, and those letters are skipped because it's a little harder to come up with easily identifiable names that start with those letters. Now, of course, if we have six lists, that means that every seventh year, the list of names repeat it, repeats itself unless, again, as we know all too well, if a storm is so deadly or costly, the name uh, will actually be retired by the World Meteorological Organization there. And uh, we've seen that happen time and time again with Harvey. We have, we have many, many names that are actually that are retired here, 89 actual retired names. You'll notice, though, if you look closely at this list of 89 names, Dorian is not on this list, which, of course, as we know, impacted the Bahamas, devastated the Bahamas just last year. Well, that's actually because the World Meteorological Organization did not meet after the 2019 hurricane season, and that's because of the coronavirus. So every year uh, after hurricane season, the World Meteorological Organization, they typically meet in the springtime. They go over a lot of different things, but one of their tasks is to review the storms from the previous season. And if one was so, so costly or so deadly, uh, that's when they decide to kind of retire that name. It gets added to this list right here again. I'm sorry, it's 89 retired names there from 1954 through 2018. And then they have to pick from a list of, of new names to kind of replace that letter. Yeah, and I, I think now, especially with uh, Delta having made landfall, the question is going to be moving forward when the WMO meets next year, will Delta be potentially retired? And I guess the question is, what happens if they decide to retire one of the Greek alphabet letters that we've only touched twice in recorded history? Right. 2005 was the other time we used these Greek letters to name storms here. But the World Meteorological Organization hoping to meet here in spring 2021. They'll review the 2019 season. They'll review the 2020 season as well. We'll probably be looking at Laura and a couple of the other storms to potentially be retired. But again, they have to meet. They have to decide that that storm um, was so costly or so deadly to, that it would be basically offensive to use that name in the future. And the way that they pick these new names, there's already a bank of names um, that they are pulling from, but say here in the Atlantic, it has to come from the geographical region, right? So in the Atlantic Basin, we have English names, we have French names, and we have Spanish names. So Isaias was not actually an English name. A lot of people wanted to call it something different or pronounce it something different, but that was actually a Spanish name. And the National Hurricane Center puts out a list of pronunciations for every single name because they are specific to that geographical region. So um, it was Isaias, and that was how the National Hurricane Center wanted us to pronounce it because they have to include kind of everyone from that area. Uh, but they will go back. They'll look at Delta if they decide to retire Delta because it is a Greek letter. Um, and what would we do in the future, right? Because we, we sometimes, well, only one other time in history, have had to go to that Greek alphabet. Well, they have already stated that if they have to retire a Greek alphabet letter, they would do so, but they would add the year and a couple other details to the list of this list of retired names here. But Delta would then be used again in the future. Uh, but again, on this list here, it would include a couple more details. So it would say Delta 2020 and maybe a couple other things.
Maybe they'll start adding in uh, other alphabets and <laughs> throwing it in there. Right, this, different uh, this regions. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so let's get the last question here, then we'll let you go. Uh, so you grew up in Florida. You've covered several storms. Uh, is there a storm to you that sticks out the most of the tons you've covered or you've lived through? And why does that one storm or couple, in your case, stick out? Yeah, you know, I grew up in here in Florida. I went through 2004. I went through 2005. Uh, we evacuated because of Charlie. Uh, that was a, you know, a significant life event for me. I was obviously a lot littler, uh, but we kind of moved across the state and it kind of chased us across the state. It was a big event in my life, but covering hurricanes as a broadcast meteorologist here, uh, Irma was, was definitely one that stuck out to me. I was actually covering it in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at our sister station there. And unfortunately, it was coming ashore here in Florida where all of my family was. Uh, they were kind of being impacted by that storm. I was kind of making decisions for them while covering it for Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was pretty interesting because we got some strong winds from that storm. It was a much wider storm. We there were some some winds that were coming in off the Atlantic and caused some severe beach erosion there in South Carolina. Um, but many, many storms I've covered and I expect to cover many more in my career. Something to, you know, look forward to the for the for the future. I enjoy covering the storms because it's, it's nice to kind of disseminate the information to the public and uh, let you guys make your, help you with your decisions and make them just a little bit easier. All right, our thanks to Amanda Holly down at WFLA in Tampa, Florida, and of course, Brian Hutton Jr. here in Raleigh, North Carolina at WNCN, helping us uh, weed through the naming of systems. You know, Amanda talked about all the storms she's covered. I don't think it's any surprise throughout history, Florida has been hit by tropical systems more than any other states, more, more than 120. Second is Texas with about half of that. So Florida sticking out like that, they kind of make themselves very susceptible. It's been so busy on the Atlantic side this year, we haven't had a lot of time to break down the Pacific side. So so before we say goodnight, let's check in on what's going on in the Pacific Ocean. The intertropical convergence zone, a little closer to the equator, usually filled with little storms, nothing of significance developing there, but there actually is a tropical depression just off the coast of Mexico. That's tropical depression Norbert. Norbert actually formed last Monday then dissipated and has regenerated over the past couple of days. It's expected to stay a weak system, a tropical depression, but we've actually had that happen on our side of the continental United States this year, having a system dissipate and then regenerate. Well, the Pacific side has joined in that party. This is the latest track for tropical depression Norbert, and they are on the in name storm over on the Pacific side. Obviously, much fewer storms than what we've had here on the Atlantic side. Norbert is number 14. The storms of note this year for the Pacific side have been Hurricane Marie, Hurricane Genevieve, and Hurricane Douglas, all category four hurricanes. Four, excuse me, three cat four storms over there. We have just the one, and that was Hurricane Laura. And that is it for tonight. Thanks so much for spending part of your night with us here on Tracking the Tropics. We'll be back here next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time doing the same thing. And for everyone involved in making tonight's show possible, thank you for being here live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Wes Owenstein.